So, so um, thank you for this introduction and thank you for staying on. <coughs> I've learned today that I shouldn't use jargon, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to use jargon, but I promise the next time I will uh, not do this anymore. Because I think it's right. Uh, the other bad news is I, I'm not really a marine or a maritime marine or maritime person, but I will tell a story today that actually includes uh, one encounter I had with a maritime species, uh, but more about that later. So I want to talk about One Health and how what this says, man is man's wolf. And I was extending it a little bit also to animals' wolf. So we are the biggest predators on the face of the planet. And that was already seen by uh, Plautus uh, shortly, uh, or, you know, like 450 uh, common era, and then used by a famous psychologist, Sigmund uh, Freud. Uh, and as was said before, I am really, uh, really fascinated by um, the one health, the one medicine concept. And uh, my former hometown, uh, Berlin, brought about many uh, scientists, among those Rudolf Virchow, who said, between animal and human medicine, there are no dividing lines, nor should there be. But my favorite quote of his is actually, he was a pathologist, it's not virtual, but a real pathologist. He said, I've done so many postmortem, but I have yet to find the soul. Um, not only do I not know much about marine biology, maritime um, affairs, I, was, I grew up um, as far away from the ocean as you can possibly grow up uh, when, you're, when you're a German. So I grew up in the mountains that you see here in the background. And I grew up with these creatures, uh, brown Swiss or brown cows, uh, my favorite animal still. Uh, this was taken in Saikung, where I live now, just a few days ago. This guy was down uh, next to the fusion and uh, had a meal. Uh, and this is a, a picture that was the press photo of the year, um, Steve McCurry. Uh, and that uh, embodies for me what I would like to be, you know, just be one with a cow and have a good time. Um, also, uh, I've come to learn since I grew up on a dairy farm, um, what, uh, from early on, what, what viruses, this is my second or my acquired uh, love, what viruses can do to animals. And usually viruses are, we believe, we don't believe that really, but uh, they are really well adapted to their host. And they, they kind of strike a beat to their host with open climate change. Not to be too negative, not to have too uh, big an effect on, on the host. But whatever, what happens often, and, and we, we are in the midst of something happening right now, that's why we're wearing the mask. If they jump hosts, it can get really ugly. And the ugliest thing I have probably ever witnessed is um, a disease of pigs jumping into cows, a virus called Ocheski's disease or pseudorabies virus. It's called pseudorabies virus because if it jumps into other animals, those animals go wild. The, it itches so bad that they self-mutilate. And I mean, this jumping of species inevitably results in death uh, because usually the veterinarians do some or one of their jobs, which is to end the lives of, of animals that can't be saved. So that has, as I said, fascinated me and shocked me from early childhood. So a few stories uh, that, but no, two stories, not a few, but don't, don't be scared, it's just a few stories. Um, and I also try not to be funny because my daughter says that's the worst you can do, try to be funny. So <laughs> I'm just being matter of fact, I use my usual self. Um, 
<laughs> so I would like to tell everybody that um, you know follow your intuition and interest and just ask the stupid question because rest assured everybody else in the room wants to ask the same question they just are too afraid to do so so um, the one health paradigm of course um, is what we all live by these days if you're in a med school and that's what we understand you know we have an, an interplay or interconnectedness between the environment humans and animals i want to focus on just one part of this uh, today very interesting as i thought so the story starts with a man called abraham maslow uh, who is famous for his uh, pyramid of the hierarchy of needs so the very basic needs you know breathe food or you need to breathe you need food water sex and so on and then he considered like creativity morality problem solving skills not as important i would argue with that but this is what he is famous for but what i really like him for is not this thing but the quote that you know applies to many researchers and, and many um of us, in fact. If the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything seems to be or look like a nail. That means, you know, if you are not able to think out of the box, you're really in not so good shape. But thinking out of the box is time and again, I think, favored by serendipity, and that's the story that I'm going to tell. And, and also, for me, you know, I, I, I thought I had it all straight and I knew everything about the particular virus that we're working on, but it turns out I didn't. So the starting point is, uh, and that's my tribute to maritime, Ursus Maritimus, the polar bear. Um, so a story of a, a polar bear in a zoo in Berlin called Knud, and he was the favorite of everybody. That the zoo made money with this animal, you wouldn't believe because it was so yeah, cute. Um, that's how he was young, so he was born in captivity. And it was all good and well until one day, not to disappoint you, but it still don't work, he died all of a sudden uh, in April 2011, so it's 10 years ago. He died of an acute uh, neurological episode. And you may wonder what has that to do with One Health. Um, and um, we just were pulled into this um, to figure out what this um, polar bear died from. And we didn't figure it out. But in the workup, we looked at different tissues from animals that you know, had similar symptoms, other polar bears and other zoos. And, and two animals were called Jerka and her boyfriend Lars, in a different zoo. So her boyfriend at the time. So they were not really monogamous. They, you know, just spent some time of their life together. And we looked for a virus because, you know, it's a long story, but the, the, the virus that was identified was a herpes virus in these um, polar bears, but we didn't know what kind of pol uh, what kind of pol what kind of virus it was exactly, and that's where we came in because we happened to work with an equine herpes virus called THV1, and you can see here, or no, maybe you can because it's jargon, but I tell you, these results show this bear seems to have. An infection with an equine herpes virus, a polar bear, an equine herpes virus. I told you these herpes viruses specifically, but viruses in general are very species specific. Usually, they don't really go from animal to animal. And Lars, so she died. Lars survived, and so we couldn't take any brain samples, of course, but. We could do other samples, and it showed that this guy apparently still had some virus in it. And there was another bear at another zoo uh, who, you know, also survived. We only could get serum, and uh, the the uh, blood was uh, 
positive for antibody. So everybody now for COVID knows what an antibody is and what a virus is. So these, these bears, or what we could tell, died of a horse virus. Long story made short. Not only was it infected by a horse virus, but by a very rare recombinant of the horse virus between equine herpes virus 1 and equine herpes virus 9. The story of equine herpes virus 9 is even more complicated because probably a rhinoceros virus just was misnamed. Uh, uh, it's a misnomer, so it's called equine herpes virus. But long story, a recombinant, an unusual recombinant infected and, or infects and kills polar bears. So this is what happened. You have a herpes virus, an equine coming, coming from a zebra, recombining, going into polar bear, killing the polar bear. You may wonder, how does that happen? Of course it happens in zoos, and usually polar bears uh, don't uh, make the acquaintance of too many zebras because they live in opposite parts of the world, obviously. But in zoos, they live in close proximity. Not only that, for enrichment purposes, because apparently polar bears like to smell, sorry, zebra poop, they get the zebra poop. And that's probably how they got infected. At least that's one of the, uh, of the theories. So herpes virus, of course, is caused, uh, gives a new zebra-derived virus. It jumps into other species, kills them. I want to say this is not the exception. It's quite a normal thing. Uh, it happens all the time, especially when humans get involved, which they do all the time. Uh, they are lethal in not what we call non-definitive hosts because adaptation uh, does not occur. They just, just jump in, they don't adapt, and they don't know what to do, and what they then is kill. The host don't know what to do either, and obviously this is aided and abetted by our activity. My second story, shorter, but nonetheless uh, also something that I want to share with you, that patients tend to pay off. I'm a very impatient man, everybody will tell you that, but I've come to learn that sometimes patience is a good thing. So we have uh, developed, though, I should say, not me, I should say, Carsten has developed, he used to work in my lab, Carsten Fischer, has developed a technique that, that really has revolutionized the way how we do work in our laboratory and many other laboratories around the world. And the, the story is that I really needed to be patient because he started in my lab in 1999. He said, I got it, I, I, I know what to do. It's only going to be a matter of weeks um, until we have it. So it took him seven years, many different attempts. And I was really about to lose my patience. But one morning he came I, I, and said, I spent a lot of time in the bathroom. and said, well, that's good for you. But what does that have to do with me or work or otherwise? He said, well, I, but I got it. And I said, well, you said that many times before. But this time he really got it. So that's a, a method that we call ampersand mutagenesis, which means you can make all the mutations in a viral or any other genome that you want. And you can do so without any leaving back any trace. So, so you can be really sneaky, which is good because this is what we wanted to do and we always want to do. So this has this method has served and others really well has served us and others really well because I was patient for, for a change uh, and, and Carson was really persistent. And it, 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 you know, all the viruses that we, or I in my lab and my, uh, not I, if I say I, I can be uh, in the lab my, my uh, uh, colleagues uh, work with, uh, it ends with SARS coronavirus 2, and, and we're, we're um, working with this virus now. We make um, different mutants, make them to just play around, but also to make vaccines. Um, and, and we use this uh, Carson technology still. Um, 
15 years old, but it still works. We're making different, and, and don't be shocked. I'm just going to show you this one. So we, we vaccinate, and then we, uh, this is experimental animals, but we vaccinate, and then we inject them purposefully and, and see whether they uh, can resist. And this curve shows you that the ones that don't get a vaccine really don't do so well. The ones that get a vaccine, installation one shot, they're fully protected. Um, they, they are fully protected uh, also if you look at um, the re uh, isolation of challenge virus. So, so there's no virus coming out of these animals. So I think um, this would be something that we uh, could uh, will uh, push forward. So the mutagenesis method is uh, very successful as a tool for everybody to make markerless mutations in virus and other genomes. Um, we have generated a plethora of different vaccines against different viruses methodology, including SARS coronavirus 2. And um, the other technology uh, that has uh, brought us to where we are now, that means we can protect against many different variants of coronavirus that are circulating right now, these uh, so called VOCs or variants of concern. And with that, Thank you for your attention.